Heaven sent. October 22nd of 2001, a day in which gaming was changed forever. This was the day that Grand Theft Auto 3 was released on the PlayStation 2 and the entire world of gaming fell to its knees with the sheer brilliance that Rockstar had brought to the table. GTA 3 brought a sense of freedom to gamers unlike anything ever seen before. The ability to take whatever you want and go anywhere you please in a video game was completely unheard of up to this point. And with GTA 3 scratching that itch for its large player base and accumulating over 14 million sales worldwide, the standard was now set. Many other developers were looking to cash out on the crime wave that was hitting gaming in the early 2000s. Not only was GTA 3 one of the most ambitious and well thought out games to change the course of how games could be played, it also showed the world how mature and gritty games can really be. Gaming was evolving, from chasing high scores and platforming to now telling full blown stories with deep character analysis and dialogue to match. Video games went from being what was viewed as a child's hobby to being something that adults could sink their teeth into and get lost in for hours. It was with this transition that many GTA copycats and other crime games alike were developed and released in quick succession. While some developers capitalized on the demand for dark and gritty storytelling, others were blinded by tunnel vision and solely focused on being as GTA as possible, with little to no success. But there were a few IPs spawned in this era that managed to deliver some truly incredible titles throughout the years, such as the Mafia series or the many Hitman titles. Bit of foreshadowing there. Now let's fast forward to August of 2006. It was a hot summer day as I skated to the mailbox to check for my monthly copy of Game Informer magazine. It had arrived and was immediately piquing my interest as I gazed upon the two shifty characters illustrated on the cover art. Who could these characters have been, you may ask? Well, none other than Kane and Lynch. While I was a young man at the time, I was truly a junkie when it came to anything crime related in gaming and movies. With video games being a way to experience these insane storylines with no real consequence, it was a no-brainer that I, alongside many other young men, were always looking for our next fix of debauchery. And this game absolutely looked like it was going to be a hefty dose. And upon reading the nine-page spread that was written on Kane and Lynch, I was excited to say the least. The long-winded article was joined by Kane and Lynch's game director, Jens Peter Kurup, as he gives us a rundown on the unstable alliance of Kane and Lynch and what made them stand out as gaming protagonists. In this article, he explains the fact that the pair are almost a duality of each other. While Kane being a calm, calculated, yet dangerous man, Lynch is purely a storm of violence and delusion that can only be contained upon his ingestion of antipsychotic medications. Alright, this is gonna be good. Sign me up. This article also covered the plot of the game, and if reading this dark and twisted setup for a brand new action-packed crime game in 2006 wouldn't have blown your sister's skinny jeans off you, I don't know what else would. But what was the plot exactly? Well, in short, one half of our psychotic duo, Kane, is being transported on a prison bus to his execution. A voice in the back of the transport warns him to get down, and before he can even react, their vehicle is struck by a semi, causing him to lose consciousness. He then wakes up to the sounds of gunfire and chaos surrounding him. In the midst of this, he's then helped to his feet by the second half of our dream team, by the name of Lynch. Lynch is not exactly here to help, as he's only a part of what Kane comes to find as a setup. You see, Kane was previously involved with a crime syndicate by the name of The Seven. He had allegedly got the better end of a heist and escaped with all the money, leaving the members of The Seven for dead. While he thought he had gotten away with it, it seems that the surviving members of The Seven have used Lynch to facilitate Kane's kidnapping and is now forcing them to work together to pull off a series of heists in order to pay back the money that Kane had allegedly stolen. And with his wife and daughter's lives on the line, he's willing to work with the likes of Lynch to make it happen. But Lynch isn't just an everyday criminal, oh no. Like we said previously, he's a medicated psychopath with unpredictable and violent urges. So, how's this gonna work? Well, in short, it doesn't. Not even in the slightest. And the stark contrast of Kane and Lynch's dynamic is truly what made the plot of this game so enthralling. Throughout each chapter, you'll get little moments of dialogue between Kane and Lynch that really showcases their dysfunction as a team. Whether it's Kane telling Lynch to shut the f up, or Lynch having a full blown conversation with himself before turning his shotgun on a crowd of innocent bystanders. Nothing ever really goes as planned, and hardly any agreements are met between the two. But all they've got is each other, and the task at hand. Come hell or high water, they'll see it through. This article also boasted the game would have a multiplayer mode unlike anything ever seen before, and over 9 hours worth of action packed single player campaign. So all in all, sounds like a pretty great game, right? Well, let's get into that. First off, the campaign was nowhere even close to 9 hours. And I'm sad to say that I'm extremely thankful for that because this game is painstakingly frustrating. The terrible shooting mechanics, probably the worst bloom I've ever seen in a third person shooter, 
and some oh. of the most brain dead enemy and teammate AI I've ever seen. This game is very hard to enjoy. Stop bitching. We still got a long night ahead of us. While the plot being quite solid, the story constantly changes and takes you to vastly different areas, all in a moment's notice. It's a bit confusing, but all in all, it's the same copy and paste gameplay throughout the entire game. You enter a room, take cover, shoot a wave of enemies, and move on to do the same in the next area. And while this was an incredibly repetitive concept, it's still one that found some pretty great success in games such as Gears of War and Army of Two. But with Kane and Lynch, this gameplay is actually the biggest thorn in its side. As I mentioned before, the gunplay is atrocious. No matter how good your aim is on controller or MK, it doesn't matter. Whether you aim or just shoot in their general direction, what the outcome the is always is the same. And with Bloom this severe, why would you make the enemy so tanky? I mean, it literally takes a clip to put the majority of your foes down. And when you're doing this time and time again, it can get old really fast. The majority of the game is spent with Lynch by your side, and although he loves to follow you around, it's rare that you will ever catch him in a good fighting position, or even connecting a single one of his shots for that matter. Lynch is basically just there for the most part. I mean sure, he dishes out some seriously unstable dialogue and vibe that really sends this game on a trip to crazy town, but other than the theatrics, he's usually just useless. Now it may be much more enjoyable playing this game on co-op with a friend playing Lynch, but good luck finding somebody crazy enough to throw away an evening on this lifeless turd of a third person shooter. Now this video isn't about bashing these games, quite the contrary. I'm really a fan of the series in disguise, but I gotta keep it real, I can see where the hate was coming from. But while the gameplay may have been something that left much to be desired, IO Interactive did in fact make up for this deficit with some of the most memorable protagonists the world of action gaming has ever seen and for reasons that are hard to come by. The story of Kane and Lynch is one that is relentless and tragic. Kane, being an ex-mercenary has lived a life of murder and theft. Now facing execution for his crimes, he's accepted his fate and is ready to bite the bullet. Brian Bloom, the man behind the voice of Kane, did a phenomenal job of bringing this character to life. A stellar performance from beginning to end, and we get our first listen inside the mind of Kane within the opening cutscene. I'm not. I can't anymore. The only feeling I have left is regret. Regret that I'll never get to know you. You are all that matters. Sorry I never understood. Your father. We listen to Kane as he recites a letter that is written to his daughter Penny. In this letter, he apologizes for his absence as a father and makes no excuse for the terrible things he's done. These opening moments are crucial to understanding Kane, as you come to find he's not as heartless as he may seem. He genuinely feels guilt in the man that he's been, and although there's nothing he can do to change these things, his last dying wish is for this letter to be given to Penny, in hopes of making amends with her. But all of this quickly shifted once Kane's prison transport is ambushed, and the entire plot of the game spirals into depravity. Lynch, on the other hand, is a character that's much harder to read. At some points, he comes off as a sensitive and caring person, while others, he's violent and purely delusional. This is mostly due to a psychotic condition he suffers from, but what really brings Lynch into the criminal underworld to begin with? Well, the reason for Lynch's incarceration is stemmed from his alleged role in the murder of his wife. While he doesn't directly admit that he ever killed his wife, it's strongly suggested that he did, and you'll come to piece that puzzle together with the many flashbacks supplied throughout the story mode. Both of these characters are not your typical duo that's seen in movies or gaming. They're both highly unlikable and non-trustworthy people who seem to have no regard for themselves or anyone around them. The exception to that rule being Kang's family and Lynch's trusty shotgun. The two are an unsavory bunch, but much like a horrifying film, Kane and Lynch has an atmosphere and story that is hard to look away from. You see, in my opinion, Kane and Lynch Dead Men could have been an amazing game, as they seem to have nailed the hardest part of making a game memorable. That lies within creating an engaging plot and memorable characters, which IO Interactive did very well in my opinion. But going back to the Game Informer article that was printed before the release of Kane and Lynch, the director of the game, Jens Peter Kirup, was making claims that this game was going to have a lot more content than what we were given at release. First off, the campaign is nowhere near 9 hours long, as an average playthrough will take you about 3 and a half to 4 hours. Thank God. Secondly, we were told that this game will be team based. Throughout most of the chapters, you're assigned a squad to work with, and while they did implement a command system to attempt to control your teammates and change positions, most of the time they're just useless and wasting ammo while they wait for you to take everyone out. Also in this article, Kirup tried to juice up the team play mechanics by saying your rapport and overall standing with your squad would change over time as you advance throughout the story. And I gotta be honest, your squad just continues to be lifeless and dumb throughout the entire game. 
Either they're running directly in the fire and getting me killed as I try to revive them, or they're running in the fire to revive me and not even firing a shot in the process. So I would usually just get revived to be downed again by the same enemies. It's fucking infuriating. For the makers claiming this game will be centered around crew mechanics, the crew sure loves to make me lose the game. And that's just bad gameplay if you ask me. They also claim that the pedestrians in the nightclub level would move to the rhythm of the music. Well, let's see how that turned out. What is that? What the fuck is that? <sighs> so it's safe to say there's a few holes in their story. But how about the multiplayer? Now with the single player campaign being a buggy mess, how does the multiplayer hold up? Well in short, much like single player, the multiplayer is loaded with potential, but executed quite poorly. And with multiplayer mode being called Fragile Alliance, I'm sure you see where this is going. Fragile Alliance is essentially a series of extraction missions, such as bank robberies and other various heists. You go in with a team of other online players, shoot your way to the loot, grab as much as you can, then meet up at the extraction point to escape with the cash. But the kicker is, all your criminal scumbags that you're playing with can actually kill each other after the looting process is over with. And as you can probably imagine, this was a total nightmare experience for most players back in the toxic days of 2008 Xbox Live gaming. As I said before, I was absolutely thrilled for Kane and Lynch to release, but mostly in part of me hearing about this intriguing multiplayer mode. But not only was it impossible to ever complete a mission without every one of your random teammates turning on each other, but it was also a very repetitive gameplay experience. The enemy AI was still horrifying and predictable. There wasn't enough strategy that was needed to keep things engaging, and to be honest, the game was kinda dead almost immediately after launch. I'll admit that I was a fan of this multiplayer mode at first, but this excitement was short-lived as the frustrating nature of this game really began to sink in. And with a lack of player base to keep Kane and Lynch on its feet, its multiplayer just sort of fizzled out over time. But regardless of all the bad things I had to say about it, Fragile Alliance will always hold a special place in my heart for the times that it was still a new and fresh experience. It really had potential to go somewhere, as multiplayer heist modes were something yet to be done at this time. But unfortunately, its sloppy execution wasn't enough to carry the weight of this tarnished masterpiece. All in all, the game didn't really back up any of Kirup's claims, but a couple of interesting characters in an interesting multiplayer mode should have been enough to score this game some decent press, right? Well, that didn't quite go as planned either. You see, back before YouTube was stacked to the gills with reliable and independent content creators for game reviews, we had to depend on the big dogs, and one of those dogs being none other than GameSpot. GameSpot was a typical source for people to read up on the latest releases, and find out what game they were willing to spend their hard-earned cash on. But when it came to Kane and Lynch's mediocrity being uncovered on a GameSpot review written by Jeff Gertzman, boy did shit hit the fan. Jeff was pretty much stating in this article the same thing I just said to you. The game has its pros and cons, while it's ridden with flaws and a lack of promised features, the game still has its charm and he gave it a pretty decent score overall at a 6.0. But shortly after, Jeff was fired, and this in turn sparked an outrage in the gaming community. A lot of accusations were fired at the creators of Kane and Lynch, but it actually turned out that Sony was threatening to pull advertising due to this review, resulting in the higher ups at GameSpot claiming Gertzman to be unfit as a reviewer, and then catered to Sony by letting him go. This was not only a disgusting example of the toxic relationship between reviewers and the companies they work for, but it also foreshadowed the horrible state in which gaming was heading at the time. I mean, just look at the state of modern day gaming with its copious amounts of loot boxes and unfinished products being the norm. I almost what miss the that? simplicity of games missing the mark, but still having plenty of effort put behind them. And while Kane and Lynch wasn't well received and somewhat boycotted following the GameSpot controversy, it came as a shock to many that a sequel was revealed to be in the works. And with the first title laying the foundation for what could have been an amazing crime game, could the second be the redemption that IO Interactive so desperately needed? Well, let's take a look, shall we? In December of 2009, the first glimpse of Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days was revealed in the form of an action-packed trailer. This trailer boasts some incredible CGI along with a very raw, almost home video look to it. The trailer begins with Kane amidst the hail of gunfire as a cameraman seemingly watches and films this chaotic event from afar. Kane is with a group of men, the majority of which are already lying dead around him, as he fights off gunfire from some unknown assailants. He tries to recover a bag from one of the men next to him, and is shot in the process. The trailer then cuts to Lynch waking up in bed and follows through with some dialogue of Lynch and his girlfriend having a discussion about Kane coming into town the next day. 
Lynch is staring at what is believed to be his antipsychotic medication, and then he begins to drift out of reality as his girlfriend says his name. It's honestly one of the coolest trailers I've ever seen to this day, and it really looks like something that would have made an incredible animated film. The trailer was generally well received, and a lot of gamers seem to have much higher hopes in its sequel. You see, around the years of 2008 to 2010, the trend of found footage films were really starting to make waves in the movie industry. From Paranormal Activity to Cloverfield, Quarantine to District 9, these movies were found to be a very unique way of immersing their audience by using a point of view perspective. It gave a very raw and atmospheric approach to filmmaking. This was uncharted waters in the world of gaming, with Manhunt being a bit of an exception. And in the summer of 2010, a demo for Kane and Lynch 2 was released for the Xbox 360, PC, and PlayStation 3. This was the first time that players could get their hands on the game and actually experience the many changes that were put forth into the sequel. The first major change being their inclusion of a unique third person perspective. The game now looked and played grittier than ever before and gave it a feel that really matched with its bleak and unsettling atmosphere. I remember being a huge fan of this new perspective, and to this day it still holds true to being a unique experience in gaming. It was almost as if you were controlling some crazy live leak video of a shootout in the streets of Shanghai. The camera that follows you around will distort any time you take damage. Shoot an enemy in the head, and their gruesome wounds will be censored with pixelation. To give it a feel as if you're watching these events unfold on television, or on some dark web chat room. Kanan Lynch 2 is just so aesthetically awesome that it still really excites me to talk about to this day. The shooting mechanics, while still having their shortcomings, felt much tighter than the previous game. Voice acting was well done, and even the multiplayer mode was showcased in the demo. Everything seemed to have been improved, and you could even say that Kane and Lynch 2 had found some well thought out innovation in their new visual style. So when the game released, I'm sure the reviews were much better, right? Well, let's just say this game is very much an acquired taste. Although there were many improvements in the look and feel of Kane and Lynch 2, there were still plenty of frustrating mechanics and buggy gameplay to leave a sour taste in the mouth of its player base. But before we go into detail on where Kane and Lynch 2 fell short in terms of gameplay, how did the story hold up? Well this time, set in Shanghai, China, Lynch is working for a criminal organization led by English-born Glazer. Glazer is in need of some help to smuggle some weapons in Africa, in which he recruits Lynch, who then calls upon Kane to come and help facilitate the deal. Kane agrees to this and states it as his last job hoping to use the money to start a new life and to help out with his broken relationship between him and his daughter Penny. In an unusual Kane and Lynch fashion, their plan is quickly spun out of control, putting their already fractured lives into a violent downward spiral of neon signs and endless gunfire. The story is much more intact compared to the story of the first game, but that's not really saying too much considering the first entry was filled with more potholes than a Detroit suburb. Cutscenes never really overstay their welcome in Kane and Lynch, considering most dialogue is done between loading screens and while you play. While I've always found this to be a much more immersive way of experiencing the story compared to just sitting back and watching, another cool little feature that ties in with the vaporwave aesthetic of the game is the use of cell phone interference in the loading screen dialogue. It's really a strange idea, but after not hearing such a noise for over a decade now, hearing it on my recent playthrough made me appreciate the detail in which they applied to keep this aesthetic going strong throughout the game. I don't want to spoil the entire story because at the end of the day, these games are still very much worth playing through. But all things considered, the second storyline is much stronger than the first entry. Albeit, it may not be anywhere near a masterpiece, it's still a ride worth strapping in for. The story has never really been the reason Kane and Lynch got such bad press. Most of the negativity was directed at its clumsy gameplay and poorly designed mechanics. So in the second entry, how do things hold up gameplay wise? Well, in short, there's not much good news to be told. In the first Kane and Lynch title, you spend 95% of your time shooting and clearing wave upon wave of enemy forces. In Kane and Lynch 2, the situation is no different. And the biggest problem in the first entry was the fact that shooting in this game was so terribly designed that it essentially made the gameplay unbearable for most. But with good news and bad news, the shooting was for sure improved in the second entry, but not to the standard of what most third person shooters were already capable of at that time. You see, both the games were falling behind severely in terms of shooting mechanics. IO Interactive claimed that they made it this way because it was supposed to be a more realistic feel to the gunfights but the only thing that was realistic was how much the shooting sucked. It's especially prevalent in the first couple chapters of Kane and Lynch 2, where you will be dealing with more waves of street level thugs and police than anything. These enemies only drop a couple different pistols and submachine guns for the most part. All these weapons are severely inaccurate, and you'll spend way more time missing your shots than connecting them. This is very reminiscent of how gunplay was in the first game, but it does seem to improve in the sequel depending on which weapon you use of course. So with the majority of the game being summed up with shooting and moving from one area to another, that's gotta get pretty boring, right? Well, just like the first game, this one is also quite repetitive. 
The only thing that made it more entertaining for me personally was the wide array of environments that these battles take place in. A good amount of the fights are pretty mundane, but there were a few select moments where you really feel the danger and immersion in these shootouts. From shooting your way through a gang infested marketplace littered with dirty DVDs and neon lights, to having a shootout inside a crime boss's very own high rise headquarters, some of the levels are brilliantly designed. And pairing those intense moments with stylish documentary style aesthetic really makes you feel like you're a part of something much bigger than your typical video game. So while both of the games in the series are severely repetitive, it's still a pretty enjoyable experience, especially considering you can finish the game in around 2-3 to three hours. It doesn't overstay its welcome too much, and any fan of a good crime thriller would have to appreciate the raw intensity that this game provides. Now let's take a moment and talk about the multiplayer. Fragile Alliance is back with a vengeance, and this time has a much more solid feel to it. I remember playing it back when the game first released, and it was a hell of a lot more fun considering the shooting had been improved and the map selections were all very well put together. Now that's not to say you didn't still have lobbies full of toxic teammates who would never let anyone make it out with a little cash in their pockets, but I never really had a problem with that once I could actually put some accurate shots on them. It was actually something I embraced because it added a little more intensity to the extraction-esque objectives each map had. And if you really think about it, extraction games are pretty common nowadays. But back when Kane and Lynch were doing their thing, that type of multiplayer had never really been heard of before. So that's another point for innovation in my book. They also added an offline arcade mode so that you can enjoy the multiplayer mode without internet. Which was great for people like me who lived in a house completely devoid of internet. Imagine that. They were also kind enough to add both on and offline co-op support so you could play throughout the story mode with a friend. Overall, Kane and Lynch 2 was still drowning in mediocrity when it came to its gameplay, but there were definite improvements made and it stands to be one of the most unique shooters I've ever played. But what is most disappointing of all is the fact that these games carried such a strong substance to them, but were never able to reach their potential due to poor game development and really just an obsolete gaming experience. Even for its time, I think if these games would have been handled better, Kane and Lynch had the potential to be at the top of every action shooter fan's list. And so, our verdict is met. Kane and Lynch, wasted potential? You bet it. But not all is lost, for these titles have become somewhat of a cult classic in the world of gaming. It's not for everyone, but if you're anything like me, you can learn to appreciate the amount of heart these games had. So give them a try if you haven't already, and just remember to tread lightly. You never know what could go wrong next. What a wild ride that was. And as much as these games are ridden with bugs and frustrating mechanics, I gotta say they've really grown on me since making this video. I mean it really is a shame that they couldn't meet their true potential, but overall both games are still very much worth playing. But that's all for today. But before I go, I just want to thank all the new subscribers that have joined the channel recently. Y'all have been showing insane love and I really can't thank you enough for being a part of this journey. Writing and video games are my two biggest passions, so to have people that appreciate what I do just feels amazing, so thank you. But until next time, my name is Vincent, hope to see you in the next video, and hope you stay blessed. Peace.